This is Annabelle Guberti, the host and publisher of the podcast Lawfully Creative. It's been a while. Sorry about that, but we are very busy at the law firm Crefovi, you know, catching up with clients, getting on some new matters in our law firm, entertainment new matters, exciting stuff coming in. So I uh, am only able to release this fabulous podcast episode now. So on the 21st of August 2023, I had the um, extreme pleasure of meeting in person Marta Dinozzi, Marta Dinozzi, who is an assistant engineer at the very prestigious Abbey Road Studios, music studios. And we had a delightful time, and Marta is a very professional, determined, and thorough person. She works very hard. You can really hear it from a, her answers to my various questions. And she takes her time to really master a craft and to really move upwards step by step at a rhythm. And I really appreciated this curiosity that she has for the field of um, music recording and music mastering and mixing and at the same time the humility somehow that she also has in assessing her um, skills, her skill set, her abilities. I, I found her a very inspiring person and I hope you you will share this, uh, this opinion with me um, after you've heard her talking um, during this interview. So have a great listen and um, Give it up for Marta Di Nozzi. I've been at Abbey Road Studios in September. It's going to be four years uh, of employment. Awesome. Um, before that, I studied one year at the Abbey Road Institute um, here in London, uh, which is a school uh, that has the name of the studios as well. Is it close by? So it used to be uh, next door in like in the building uh, next to Abbey Road, but uh -huh. now they relocated to Angel Studios, uh, which oh, wow, is a much bigger f uh, facility, but they have m much more... In Eastington? Space. Yes, yes, okay. yes. There's a, uh, there's a bus that you can take on there. Yes, <laughs> yes. Over there, I think it's 143 or something, mm -hmm. which brings you to Eastington. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So you did that for a year? Yes, so, so the course is a year okay. and is um, sound engineering and uh, music production. And after that, uh, there was the possibility for me to stay at the school for a bit more because um, some students get the opportunity to work in the school as technicians. So mm -hmm. they take care of the facilities, they help the new students settling in and troubleshooting if they're in the studios, you know, just help around. So I did that for around seven months. And after that, there was an opening for a runner's position here at Abbey Road Studios, so I applied for the job. What does that mean, runner's position? So, it is the entry level for the people that want to do um, engineer, enge sound engineering in a, in a studio. Okay, so, so like in a law firm you would say, I'm a trainee, of, I mean, you were not, no longer a trainee, I suppose, so like first year associate, you would say in a law firm, uh, so yeah. you were like... I think so. Okay. Um, a runner. In, in runner, the, studio in, runner. In so time. they were used to call T-boys uh, once uh, because they, they were the people that actually were taking care of bringing drinks and teas and food to the, to the sessions, to mm. the clients. That's, that's, that's important. Oh <laughs> my God, <laughs> very important. Um, right now, obviously, uh, there's a bit more to do in terms of what concerns a runner in a, in a studio as big as Abbey Road. Sure. Um, so you don't just bring drinks anymore or food anymore to people, but you take care of uh, the booking of the microphones, you help setting up, packing down. You're basically the first one to arrive in the morning and the last one to leave mm -hmm. uh, in the evenings after you help ev helped everyone in every session in the whole building. Yeah. So Definitely uh, like a first year associate in a law firm. <laughs> yes. 
there's uh, the learning curve is uh, pretty steep because in your first few months you kind of learn to do everything. You learn you have to learn every room. You have to learn uh, uh, about everyone and all, all the members of the team and how things work. So it's pretty intense. Speaking about that, actually, how many rooms are there in uh, Abbey Road Studio? Um, if I'm right, there's a total of seven. Wow. Okay. So we have the three main studios. So Studio One, Two, and Three. Uh, the most famous ones. Then we have a couple of mixing rooms for Atmos called Mixstage and Penthouse. And then we have some smaller studios called um, uh, Front Room, uh, The Gatehouse, and uh, which are more for um, sort of uh, band, smaller... Um, Less money. Less budget, let's say, as well, which is good because, you know, you can get a nice vocal recording or a guitar or some drums recorded here okay. uh, in, a, in a nice space. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's quite, quite a few rooms to cover. Seven. Yeah, around seven. Yes. Lovely. And um, I remember this uh, funny anecdote about the, the Rolling Stones who uh, recorded uh, one of a album mm -hmm. outside of the UK because the taxation rate was 70% at the time in the 70s and, and or even more than that and they actually decided to relocate in the south of France in, um, in a very very plush villa um, I think on the peninsula of uh, um, it will be right back to me but between Villefranche-sur-Mer and, uh, and uh, Monaco mm -hmm. and so I think it was called West, uh, West Coast or West Coast. and so these guys, the Rolling Stones they were always recording their sessions in the middle of the night like starting from midnight mm -hmm. until 5am and so at some point all the neighbours in the plush villas around uh, around them in uh, uh, in this uh, peninsula, peninsula called I think Cap, Cap, Cap Ferrat Saint Jean Cap Ferrat that's what they were in mm -hmm. Saint Jean Cap Ferrat they actually uh, called the police and decided to evict them, so they had to bugger off the Rolling Stones. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm um, mentioning this anecdote is because I was wondering if here at Abbey Road Studios you can accommodate the needs of um, rockers <laughs> who are a bit, you know, bizarre. I mean, for, for normal people who work, mm -hmm. say, 9 to 7 or 9 to 8 p.m., um, and, you know, if they want to start recording at 10, 10 p.m. or mm -hmm. midnight, is that something that can be accommodated here? And, and also being compliant with uh, rules, I suppose this is a listed conservation area. Yes, so. the building is... Oh, as well, yeah. okay. So, uh, yes, it used to happen much more in the past, like at okay. the time of the Rolling Stones or okay. the Beatles or... Um, Right now, our days are long, but they start in the morning and we finish in the evenings. Okay. Um, but if there's some special need or requirement, yes, we, we can accommodate that. Right. We, we, we had some sessions and we still have sometimes that they want to start later in the afternoon or evening. They go up until, well, not say the morning, but yeah. So sometimes um, it happens, but less sometimes it happens. than before. Yeah, like yeah, 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 less than before. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Do you think this is because they, they take less drugs, or? <laughs> well, I would not know about that, but um, it might also be. Um, I don't know. I guess it's some sort of rule as well. Um, uh, the, the usual booking is from. Uh, 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. and if you want to do more than that or different timings than that is something that needs to be discussed with the office so having a management okay. that actually takes care of all of this stuff with the clients it kind of takes the pressure off of us in terms of how many hours we have to work yeah. even during the night so but it's up to the office, just, yes. Maybe it could be just a jet lag thing, you know, if they come from Australia oh, yeah, or yeah. the US. Uh, we, we have a lot of that, like a lot of clients come from uh, from the US and um, wow. we we start later in the day and we, and we finish later at night to try and accommodate the fact that they're, je they're a bit jet lag. Uh -huh. Or uh, we do a lot of streamings of, uh, streaming of audio and picture if we do movies um, to people that couldn't come maybe to be here for the session so the clients some of the clients are still in the u.s really? so they oh, well, what you are recording yeah 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 streaming streaming live live with musicians who are in-house here yes 
Wow, you must uh, have an absolutely amazing uh, Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, more than Wi-Fi is wired, so our internet, it is, uh, wow. in fact, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, so we are able to stream audio and picture in sync with the orchestra or the musicians that are playing at the same time. Yes, yeah, so if it's with Los Angeles, by definition, you would have to start exactly. working. Yeah. So Afternoon. sometimes we start at 2 p.m. and they wake up 5 a.m. to be able to get the streaming wow. and, you know, for us not to be too late in the afternoon or evening mm -hmm. to get through the night. So we get a lot of that with clients that come from different places in the world. Uh, wow. And are you local to here or do you have to commute? Because especially visa hours are a bit, you know, uh, um, can change. Are you like... I, or perhaps you can cab it when, when I more, recently right? bought a motorbike. Ooh, that's dangerous. <laughs> I know, tired. but I'm Italian, I come from Rome. So I learned to drive there and I got my first moped when I was 14, my first motorbike <laughs> when I was 16. So, um, so I decided um, since I live in North London and it would take me uh, almost an hour to get here with Tube, I was like, you know what? So you, you, you take your, motor, your motorbike? Yes, right? yes. And now that's in cool. less than half an hour I'm here. So so that's pretty cool. Awesome. That's great. Well done. <laughs> so four years. So you said, and sorry, um, I might have misunderstood, but you said four years working here. Mm -hmm. Was that comprising... Covering your time when you were at the Abbey Road Academy or was or school, or, or was that um, in addition? In addition. Okay, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. five years here in London then? Uh, five years and a half in London, yes. Five uh, years and a half in London. Because I think you did a bit of free lancing in the meantime. In the, before being recruited here permanently. Yes, right? so when I was uh, still a technician at the Institute, I did a bit of freelancing as an um, uh, assistant for a mixing engineer here in London. Okay. So I was doing a bit of that as well. So two or three jobs, and then I got the interview for, for this job. So. Right. Is it, is it permanent? Are you, or are you freelance or here? Or? I am uh, employed okay, by, good. by the studios, so I mainly work here. Congratulations, yes. that's wonderful. Thank you. So is that okay if we perhaps go like uh, a bit back just to yeah. understand you know, yeah, where, you, where you come from? And so you are from home? You said yes. you were from Rome. I'm from Rome. First moped at 14 years old. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. I, bought, I bought a scooter in the south of France in my in my 30s, but uh, this was the first time using a scooter because my mother never wanted me to take a moped. Yeah. And 10 minutes after I bought it, I, I smashed it. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, I forgot I had been insurance already. But oh, I, was, yeah. I had to take a course. I had to actually go back to Paris and take a course and to be able to ride a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can you do with those intellectuals? They don't know what to do with their hands. <laughs> anyway, so um, are you coming from a family who is mus musical in, in itself? Are your parents mm. in the business? No. Uh, my dad is a chemical engineer and my mom is a gymnastic teacher. So, um, okay. But both of them, before um, having their... like let's call it real jobs, they were passionate about something that regarded music. So my mom used to dance, mm -hmm. and she did it for many years, uh, uh, like ballet and also modern uh, style. Oh, um, but uh, when she figured out that she didn't have the right body or what they considered the right body at the time mm -hmm. to become like the first ballerina or, you know, the one at the front of... Um, uh, of the stage she had to make a choice even if she loved dancing she was like I'll, I'll probably have a better career if I go towards gymnastics and that's what she did so she gave up the the, the musical part of her life in some sense to get some uh, um, what was considered at the time more of a real job so that's where she went she did it for her whole life um, was she going to um, a musical conservatory to get her uh, ballet classes or were uh, also some some music uh, music sessions were and 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 classes were given to other to students or because in france for example where i was um, brought up and where uh -huh. i was born um almost every town has got a municipal town conservatory uh -huh. where you can study music as well as solfege, solfeggio, so, yes. uh, scoring and uh -huh. um, reading reading scores and also playing instruments and also um, 
learning ballet. Yeah. Over only the class, like mostly the classical mm -hmm. ballet. So yeah, yeah, is yeah. it like this as well? In so in Italy, Italy it is like that. We have yes. uh, what we call conservatory, mm. um, yeah. and there's one in every in every city. Okay. Uh, very famous, the one in Rome, of especially. Um, yeah. But no, my mom never studied there. Um, she she took uh, ballet classes and all of that for many years until she was seventeen, eighteen. Okay, more um, on the pri private. Private, yeah, school. yeah, yeah. And then she went to uh, a university. You could actually um, study uh, how to become uh, a gymnastic teacher. And okay. It was like a, a uni, a university. Sure. It's like. Four years or five years? Which 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 she university did she go to La Sapienza? No, she. My mom is from the north of Italy. Ah, okay. She's uh, from Bassano del Grappa, which is uh, out of uh, Vicenza, mm -hmm. and it's near Venice. So it's the oh, northeast. Okay. Okay. So she went to Milan okay. to study there. Um, um, and after which, that, which she university just, did she go to? Um, if you remember. Yeah, I, do, I, I think I do remember. Um, I don't think she would go to Bocconi for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't worry, it's fine. No, it's because she always tells me I've done this and now I can remember the the name of it. Uh, and I'm pretty upset I'm, about it don't actually. Worry, it will. La Scala is in, is in Milan, isn't it? Yes. And do they also do ballet performances there or is it. Uh, yeah, they do. They do. And um, my mom always uh, used to tell me about when my grandfather would bring her to La Scala. Uh, uh, and it was like a very special thing because the ticket cost a lot of money because yeah. it was, you know, the nicest place you could go to see ballet. Yeah. And uh, she remembers that. Um, about about my grandpa gr that didn't have like all the money in the world to take her, but he would when she was younger, and then she grew up with the idea of the ballet. Also because of that, because she witnessed at La Scala sure. some nice things. So this is the equivalent of the English National Opera here. The, um, sorry, the Royal uh, Opera House. Yes, which is here in uh, uh, Covent Garden, and I think the Pal Palais Garnier in, in mm -hmm. Paris. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she had to pivot and go yes. into gymnastics, but she was musical in the sense that she used the uh, uh, music to, to be able to do her yes. ballet and dance classes. What about your dad? So my dad as well, um, he's, um, I would not say dream, but what he loved was art. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made sculptures of his whole life. Okay. Uh, he started with some materials and then went through different phases, reusing different kinds of materials um, and becoming more abstract. Uh, but in the meantime, he was a chemical engineer. So he got, um, and then he met my mom, they got married. Uh, my brother was born. So, you know, he had to kind of provide for the family. Mm -hmm. So in, I always saw him in his spare time making these constructions and this. Um, so beautiful not, things it, but it's got an artistic side yes um but it wasn't until he uh retired that he, he could uh, get all of his time put into his passion which was making sculptures mm. um uh, he was not a lot at home he would be out traveling around the world mm -hmm. um who did he work for so he worked for big chemical companies. Um, uh, one was called uh, Henkel. They make um, any source of from soaps uh, to to products for cleaning. And then he also worked uh, for a company that was taking care of um, oil refineries. Mm. I don't know if that's the name for, the, for them. So but he probably had to go to Middle East a lot. Yeah, he went to Middle East a lot. He would tell me about getting helicopters and, you know, getting to the middle of the sea on the platforms uh -huh. where, yeah, it was like, uh, he, was, he was basically never there. He was at home once a week for many, many years. Um, and then my auntie... Um, she passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. It was uh, his sister. Okay. She was an accomplished uh, painter. Mm -hmm. um, and some of her works, there's a couple of big mosaics that actually you can see in the underground in Naples. She was she, she lived her whole life basically in Naples. Mm -hmm. um, 
So she was an accomplished painter, and in the uh, meanwhile, uh, she was the older sister, but she was always a bit the more the say the the the, the biggest character. My dad was uh, the more introverted. Yeah, more introverted. So he always saw her doing whatever she wanted to do and uh, living her life, pursuing her art. And in the meantime, he actually had to. Pro felt the, the weight of providing for his family so he couldn't pursue his artistic side and I always thought that it was really nice that when he finally got to retired he now can spend all of his time doing that and he's actually um, doing a lot of nice things in Rome uh, with art galleries and you know getting his art out and I'm really proud of him for that. That's wonderful. And he was always the biggest supporter of me making music when I was younger and I think the fact that he couldn't actually pursue that in his life early on made him understand how important it was for me to actually be having this, his support in pursuing making music or buying me a guitar or pay for um, music lessons. Okay. Is that what happened? You played the guitar? Yes, as, as yes, child? yes. When um, did you start? So when I was around six years old, um, I, I always asked to um, um, Santa for Christmas uh, yeah. either a keyboard or a drum uh, kit, uh, but you know, they, they, it, it, what would arrive was not the real thing. It was like a toy version of all the musical oh, instruments yeah. I wanted to play. So when I was six years old, I talked to my mom and I was like, Mom, I want to play the violin. The violin? Yes. Oh. And she was like, I don't think you want to do that. I do think. <laughs> you know how terrible it sounds when kids are actually yes. studying and practicing. Yes. Like, um, so what she told me was that I think you want to play the guitar. Ah, okay. Mom, I think I want to play the violin, but okay. <laughs> and she told me, one day you're going to thank me because when there's going to be a bonfire somewhere, you're going to bring your guitar and you're going to be able to sing to people and you're going to be able to have a band or play with other people. But with the violin, it would be much more difficult for you to, to do something like that. But well, you could have joined... An, an orchestra, ensemble. yeah, an yes. ensemble, but that would be more on the yeah on the um, classical side of things. Exactly. So, anyways, she kind of decided Did you enjoy to enjoy eventually. The oh yeah, I loved it. Okay. I played uh, guitar, classical guitar until uh, twelve. Okay. So, did you go to a concert conservatorio? Or? Uh, no, I did like private, private lessons, well. and then I did you learn how to read a, 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 a score sheet? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I learned how to read music. I was doing solfeggio. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, all of that music okay. theory. Starting from six six years old. Yes. Um, and then when I went to middle school in Italy, uh, you actually have the choice, even if it's a public school, some yeah. schools provide like um, extra music lessons. Okay. So my middle school, between the, uh, the age of 11 and 13, I was actually able to play classical guitar at school, at school. after uh, the normal hours. Which uh, I, I studied actually in... Um in in in, Buc in Bocconi, so I was in Milan, oh, wow. but, but I also had a, um, a, a, a a pen friend in um, uh, Grotta Ferrata, which oh is, yeah, which just outside above, of Rome, exactly, yeah. which is above Rome, and so I, I used to go to Rome, uh, Melandina, to Chiverin, Alofa, Mugin, Siante, so which. Uh, which district of Rome were you? Um, so I'm from the north of Rome. Okay. Um, uh, when I was a kid, we used to live in Balduina, and then we moved to uh, Monte Mario, and my parents now live in La Giustiniana, which is on Via Cassia. It's like the north of Rome. Okay. And at the time, uh, I was in elementary school. Well, in the meantime, when I was a kid, we lived five years in Spain, so I lived five years in Barcelona from the okay. age of 40 to 9. Because of your dad's uh, job? Yes, um, oh. because he became responsible for um, like a Europe division on his company, so he had to relocate. Mm -hmm. And then we came back to Rome and I studied at the, um, yeah, did a couple of years of elementary school there. And the middle school was uh, Giovanni Ventitresimo, uh, which is in Balduina mm -hmm. neighborhood. And after that I went to high school 
Uh, every every end of the year around May June, were you taking some uh, um, concorsi like uh, exams? Exams. Yes, yes, that's mandatory okay. every year. Okay. Yes. So you were basically every every year going up a, a, a level. And, uh, and yes, like how it works in Italy is I find is slightly different than what is it, it is here. Uh, here they have all these kind of levels with uh, you know the letters in front of the uh, of, of it like uh, A something or this right. grade. Uh -huh. um, I never saw any of that in any of the private schools I was attending. Okay. It's like this is something you would do uh, to have like the diploma that certifies that if yeah. you then you want to access cons the conservatory or you know exactly. want to do a specific job but like a regular school would not provide you with uh, some certificate that tells you which level exactly you are in you know for a, a European rec recognition or world's like recognition of that um, okay. I um all over you. At around 11 years old, I started playing the, the piano, and then uh, I decided to switch to the flute, uh, flauto traverso. Mm -hmm. And every year in uh, in June, we had to to play <laughs> in front of a jury of like five or six music teachers in the conserva Conservatoire de Suresnes, so Conservatory of Suresnes, and uh, it was pretty scary. Yeah. Most of the time, we had to. We couldn't have a score sheet. We had to have memorized everything. My heart. So yeah. ooh, French are pretty tough with a music education. Yeah. Were you were your your teachers were they telling you um, you are gifted? You 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 should really pursue? They used to tell me always you are a good player but you are lazy. You don't want to You don't uh, rehearse every evening no, no, one no. hour. It was the opposite. It was like you don't read fast enough. You don't read music fast enough, and since your brain knows it, you learn everything by heart because you have amazing ears. Wonderful. So what I used to do, I, I used to know every piece by heart just because my teacher would play to me a few times, and then I would actually understand when my fingers were going. I was taking a glance at the at the music, but I was not actually reading it all the time. And I was going just because of the sounds of the notes, not because of this, the notes I was seeing on the paper. Surely, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you know that most um, um, guitar musicians in the, uh, in, in the rock, and uh, I mean like in contemporary music, but mm -hmm. in the space of pop music and stuff, like commercial music, they, that's most of them they don't read yeah, music. Yeah, true. It's just by yeah, yeah, yeah. By, by by ear and uh, and looking at how the you know the, the, the calls are being played and it's pretty amazing. And yeah, my I'm, I must admit I'm very dependent on my score sheet. If I know I was score sheet, I still play the flute from time to time mm -hmm. um, at weekends and um, I, my memory is terrible. <laughs> 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 just score sheet. <laughs> No, I'm exactly the opposite. Um, and then I found out when I was a bit older that I had, uh, you know, nobody ever, no um, doctor ever diagnosed anything to me. But um, I um, sometimes when I was um, at school and we were doing mathematics, I used to switch numbers when I was uh, writing yeah. them. Uh, maybe a touch, uh -huh. but that would not help also with reading music. That's why I was so lazy as well, because I was probably getting a bit confused and my brain could not process fast enough the, the paper. Um, so I relied a lot on my ears. Mm -hmm. And at the time, all of my teachers were just saying, you should not do that, because when you need to read and you have, like, you're never going to be able to sight read anything if you keep doing this. Yeah. But I didn't care because I didn't want to become a, a classical uh, guitar player. Mm -hmm. That was not my thing. I was just feeling the music inside of me, and I wanted to play along. Or I uh, I liked a lot of different music, like especially pop music at the time when I was younger, uh, pop rock. So that was my aim. It was not towards classical world, but more okay. towards rock pop world. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was not. It was very important to be able to read music, but yeah. sight reading was not like it's paramount. Yeah. If you were not thinking of becoming a, um, a part of an ensemble where you would be the, the, the star guitar player and 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 and, or, 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 and, and 
limiting yourself to just classical music. You, you want it to, actually outside your classes where you're sometimes taking a guitar and trying to uh, replicate some tunes you were hearing oh, on the yeah. radio or at TV or on the... All the time. All the time. That's great. Yeah. When I was younger, internet was a thing, but it was not like as big as now. You can find any uh, progression of chords for, for from any song of any genre. Mm -hmm. At the time, you would type, you know, chords for this song, and maybe someone had the time to kind of make uh, some sort of website in which there was some right. indication. So I could yeah. not find everything on the internet, so I had to rely on my oh, ears. Yeah. When was that? Beginning of the 90s? Beginning of the 2000s? Uh, beginning of the 2000s. Um, I was born in 1989, so I was 11 around 2000, 2000 2001 actually. Yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. I would say 2002, yeah. 2003, I started, yeah. I asked my parents to buy me an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar and uh, they were so nice and they did it. <laughs> wait, wait, which, which brand did they? Uh... Um, they bought me a Fender, um, a, a Squire actually because it was okay. a bit cheaper because you know when you have a kid and they're like oh I like this you never know if it's really really what they want to do or if they're gonna pursue it so I think they went for the safest option which was a cheap guitar with a very cheap amplifier so I had that and then they, um, they bought me Annie Bannett's um, acoustic guitar uh, so. so I would spend my whole like my days with the acoustic guitar trying to sing I don't know Alanis Morissette the Cranberries so you, you would spend your days? yeah yeah all day that's what I was doing um, right, because I mean, I, I mean, for me, the I would play the flute for an hour, and then I would be okay. I've rehearsed my flute. I'll talk to you in two or three days, or yeah. tomorrow. But I, I wouldn't spend the whole day playing the flute or the piano. I was out of a wow. So you were really into it. I was really into it, and I wanted to sing it. So what I started to do. Were you thinking uh, in your when you were a teenager that you actually would become a professional? Oh. Um, well, as I kind of progressed and I became older, I started looking for people that could play with me. So I joined the band ah. as a guitar player first. And then Not a bass, guitar. Guitar, yes. Okay. But like a, a classical or contemporary? Like no, 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 electric, electric guitar. Oh. Yeah, so um, what happened in my high school is that once a year they would uh, do what they call the Settimana di Didattica Alternativa, which means that for a week the students were in charge of the program. Awesome. We, it could be chaos, but it could also be really nice. So we used to watch movies and have a chat about it with all the students. Uh, or we used to make laboratories where you could learn things about different things. And there was also the laboratory about music. Mm -hmm. So I was there. Um, people was, that, was that like a really advanced school or like a like a progressive school? Or was that no, public school? Public school. A public high school in the north of Rome, in wow. not a particularly fancy neighborhood as well. Wow. Um, so we would do that and uh, w people would bring their instruments and everyone would have a go at playing. So whoever knew how to play something would be like, oh, let's try and play this song and just, you know, kind of rehearse together. So I, I got noticed because I was playing the guitar and I think I was playing Nothing Else Matters by Metallica on the acoustic guitar wow. and uh, one of them came over to me and was like oh I have a band and I need a new guitarist would you come and try you know um, I was like, what was he playing himself? they were doing a mix of some original songs kind of new metal influence okay. like on the heavier side mm -hmm. you were going, going for your goth phase <laughs> Um, you know, wearing or dark, dark clothes, uh, uh, black course. everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely necessary in the, in the middle of summer in, in Rome. Of oh my God! Yes, <laughs> I used to wear Dr. Martins uh, to the sea as well, like all the sand going in that. Like, anyways. <laughs> So um, I was like, okay, I'll bring over my guitar. The Doc Martins are great here in London. Not yeah, there. yeah, not not in Rome. No, not on the on Ostia Beach. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so I went and I tried, and they were like, okay, you can play with us. So from there I started. And how long did you stay in the band? 
Um, it was roughly a year, also, but then... You were, were you the only female member of the band? No, or? the singer, she was a girl, oh, good. but then at some point she decided to leave the band, or I don't know what happened, and I got called, and they were like, would you try and sing as well? It's like, well, no, I know I'm not terrible, but I, do, I don't know if I'm capable of being the front woman of a band, but we can as try. As well as playing the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So I was doing the um, rhythm, rhythmic guitar, not the solo parts and stuff, but rhythmic guitar and, and singing. Wow. And then so you did it? I did it for a bit, but then we never got to do to the stage, uh, and the band just did, didn't work. So uh, with the keyboard player, we formed a different band, uh, where I was singing... Uh, um, we were doing a mix of uh, covers and uh, original songs that I was um, uh, composing with the keyboard player as well. Wow. Um, How old were you by, by then, more or less? I would have been, I don't know, 17. Okay, so you, at the same time you were preparing as well what we call the baccalaureate and the a in France and the A levels here. So okay, I, so that was pretty intense. Uh, it? Yeah, at 18 we do uh, esame di maturità. Yeah. Yes, that. Which, yeah, yeah, which yeah. section were, were you in? Were you like literally or or, or I, maths? Or? I took the scientific, what we call the scientific path. So I had a lot of maths, physics. Yeah. Um, Actually, I I read an article saying that people who are usually uh, were good at. Uh, uh, playing music, usually they've got also some skills for, for maths, math stuff. Yeah. I think that's quite linked. Yeah, uh, well, maths was my weak, po weak point. <laughs> scientific, let's say. Scientific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it is interesting because I think it's related uh, by the fact that um, music is a language and it's a written language as well, mm -hmm. so the uh, same as mathematics, really. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you if you know how to read numbers, it, it, it might be that your brain is wired in a way that mm -hmm. it's good, kind of easier for you to read music as well. It, nice. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, keys and stuff. Yeah, so I was doing all of that in the meantime, and uh, I was also trying to get my uh, exam done. Which, uh, let's mention it, because I think it's true also in Italy, the scientific um, esame di maturità is probably the toughest among all of the... Yeah? Yeah, let's say you have the... That, that's the way it is in France, if you take the scientific route, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be... The toughest. two more difficult ones are Liceo Classico and Liceo Scientifico, which is a classic literature, okay. uh, because you you studied there uh, Greek, Latin, mm -hmm. and, you know, literature, uh, but in the scientific path you still have Latin, but you have much more mathematics, physics, uh, biology, chemistry, and all of that kind of sure. stuff, so those are the two most difficult ones, yeah. Two lady at 17 years old? I was everywhere. I don't know where I was spending the energy if I think about it now. <laughs> you know? awesome. And were you going to gigs? Were you going to concerts? Because there are, there, there's a, there's, I think there's a massive arena in, in, uh, in, in Rome as well where you can see very large bands. And there's, like, you know, yeah, bands. there's different ones. Like yeah. they, We have festivals every summer. We have Capannelle, which is a huge venue. We have um, the Auditorium. Parco della Musica, where classical music happens, but also a lot of gigs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my first ever gig, I was 15. It was at the Teatro Tenda Strisce, just outside of Rome. And I went to see Lacuna Coil, which is an Italian metal band. Wow. Uh, and... Shall we write No, 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 no. <laughs> Staying <laughs> with no. your friends? I went with two of my classmates. Oh. We were the same age. And uh, uh, one of my classmates' mom uh, brought us, got us to the gig, okay. left us there, wow. uh, and then came back to pick us up like two, three hours later. Uh, my parents were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Um, and, you know, it was amazing. We were all horrible and sweaty and just, like, jumping around. So I was about to ask you whether you were into Lucio Dalla e Giovanotti, but perhaps not then. <laughs> <laughs> no, not then. No. Um, I have uh, uh, most respect for, for both of them, and especially Lucio Dalla, I think it kind of changed 
completely uh, Italian music in, and it affected a lot of people in so many ways. He was an amazing songwriter. Like, uh, but it's a completely different genre. Yeah, uh, yeah that's like popular Italian music uh, made with a lot of heart. But at the time, I was full no. metal, new metal. I wanted to, you know, the the noise from the guitar, the distorted guitars. You know, the, the French intellectuals would say, Italian music, they reply, Paolo Conte. Yes, <laughs> that's another classic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really do like Paolo Conte, by the way. Okay, great. So, I actually, in a way, I think, really, you coming to London made a lot of sense in view of your artistic, no, I mean, music, m musical tastes. But you went... Um, it says on your profile for Abbey Road Studios, you went to St. Louis College of Music. So how did this, was was this after the Licenza di Maturità or, 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 or before or at the same time? Or? Um, so the path that got me to where I'm here now has not been exactly straightforward. Um, when I did my Esame di Maturità, I got my score, you know, I got out of uh, high school and I got the choice. Like, everyone in my family has uh, a degree, so they, they all attended a university, um, which made me uh, think that automatically I should do it too. Okay. Uh, do you have a lot of siblings? I have just one brother, okay. and he's 13 years older than I am. Okay. So what does he do? He's a, um, a broker. He lived in London for 11 years and then went back to uh, Spain. He's married to a Spanish woman, okay. and they have three beautiful kids. In Barcelona, is uh, They are in Madrid. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so he probably studied economics. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. Um, so... Uh, so there was this thing, this pressure about getting a degree. I kind of felt it, yes. Yeah. And the problem at the time is that I didn't know what I wanted to do. Or I, or I thought I didn't know. Because I didn't see music as an option. Really? Yes. I thought I wasn't talented enough to become a player. Like, a, I don't know, a session musician mm -hmm. or playing just, you know, as, as a job. Uh, I thought I was not talented enough to become a singer. Um, or to join the conservatorio because it was a tough path mm. um, because I was passionate about music but I thought that having a band was not enough to kind of you know get a living out of it mm. so I had to make a choice um, there were two things that kind of got my attention one was architecture which is uh, really uh, important in Rome. We have one of the oldest faculties for architecture, Alla Sapienza. Mm -hmm. And then biology. Very yeah. Wow. Both were very different. Yeah. Yeah, we're thinking, how am I going to earn my crust? It's great to love music, but if I can't live... Yeah. Um, so what I did, since biology was what we call open number, so you can enroll and just you automatically in but architecture had a test because there's a lot of people applying and mm. not enough spaces um so i was like i'm gonna attempt the architecture one if i get in it means that you know destiny decided for me that i'm going to become an architect and not a biologist but did you have to study hard to get this well no? yeah okay. i had to study for a few months okay. um there were like three thousand people applied applying in the go like the first thousand or something less 800 yeah. so i got in wow well done yeah uh did, did you did you enroll into a course to to prepare yourself for this entrance exam or did you prepare by yourself no i got the books and i studied but by yourself. yeah well done and um so I got in, so I started studying architecture, and one of the first things they tell you... Seven years of studying before you can even go to a practice. <laughs> so it's five years of uni, but yeah. the average time that a person would take to actually get to the degree is seven years. Yeah. And the first thing they tell you, the first lecture, they look at, you know, you're there with hundreds of stu new students, and they look at everyone and they're like, with the microphone, they say, hi, welcome, you're, you know, one of the most prestigious faculties for architecture in the world. Uh, I, I enrolled in the Ludovico Cuaroni um, faculty. There were two at the time, Valle Giulia and Ludovico Cuaroni. One was, yes, one was considered more of a, um, 
classical approach to a study of architecture. The other one was more sort of design, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, so I got the Lud in the Ludovico Queroni one, who was the founder. Um, a more classical one. Yeah, more like architecture. That's it. Um, and in, in in the microphone they said uh, we have a twenty five percent rate of actually people getting to the degree. So this means that... Um, Even with an entrance exam, which is tough. Yeah, so it, this means that three out of four of you are, to are not going to make it. So you, if you have any doubts now, this is the first day, you still have time to enroll in a different faculty and study something else. So if you want to leave, this is the moment Why? to do it. Why are so many people f falling out of a, of a curriculum? It is very long, um, and it's it's a very difficult uh, um, one. Wow. Is the teachers are uh, you know established architects uh, or people that belong to families that where everyone was an architect mm -hmm. and they kind of expect so much of you and it's pretty brutal the approach they take because they have so many students they don't need you. That's the point. They're like, you wanted to do it, so you have to demonstrate me your worth. Um, your worth. So how, is, how, how long did it take you to understand that was a bit tough? <laughs> so I did it for five years. I arrived to the last year, oh my gosh. but it would have taken me another three years to get the degree. And by then you were not yet at San, San Luis College of Music. By then I was 23. I thought I was old to change and I was seeing my life as a failure because I, I you know I would have to spend another three years of my life studying something that I was not really passionate about okay but then you had ascertained you were not really passionate about architecture. yes and in the meantime I was um, making music with my band we were doing gigs and I was doing all that stuff on the side as well and your parents were okay to support you for five years or you had to work as well um or? Like every once in a while, I was kind of helping in my um, cousin's. Uh, he has a shop in the underground okay. for selling tickets. Okay. So every once in a while, my dad would send me there saying, you know, you are, you are a grown up now. So okay. if you need the money to for. Non sei una vitellone, devi andare a lavorare. Esattamente, esattamente, proprio così. So, which is fair, is fair, because I was pursuing my interests and music and I was not progressing fast enough uh, with architecture and at some point I was just so sad and depressed that my my parents came to me and they were like Marta you can you cannot you know go on about this like this because the, I don't think that's the right approach to to life really so if this doesn't make you happy it's fine you're not a failure find something you're passionate about and you want to actually do. It doesn't matter if you're not going to become an architect. Just please, please wow. change this situation because we don't know how to help you anymore. You were really feeling quite depressed. Yeah, I was really feeling sad, yes. Um, so how did you how did you come across St. Louis College? Of it Louis? was actually my mom. Oh, she was really? like... Um, because I didn't know about the existence of St. Louis College of Music, I only knew about the Conservatorio in Rome, okay. that they were, you know, teaching music in all of its uh, uh, different fields. Probably classical music. Though. Mostly classical. Yeah. And then I, what I was doing with my band, I, I, I had the computer and I would try and record our music. So I had downloaded all, all the, these free softwares you could use. Wow to actually be able to, with just a microphone, to get like a track going on and okay. then maybe record the guitar on top and maybe, you know, record the bass on top. So in the meantime, so, by myself, yeah. I was trying to do that, but I didn't know how it worked. Uh, as a sort of hobby, you were kind yes. of improvising yourself. Yes, in as a hobby. So my parents were like, you spend all day doing this kind of thing. Is, isn't there anywhere anywhere you can learn about this i didn't even think about sound engineering i didn't even know how, what it was at the time and so i looked uh, uh, at the conservatorio and they had a section about sound engineering but it was so classically so you had to learn the setti clavio which is all the seven uh, different um sort of uh, keys you can uh, 
uh, sing to, you know, you have um, uh, la chiave di sol, la chiave di fa, so the mm -hmm. bass mm -hmm. and, uh, and the treble, but you, you had to learn all about the theory of m music theory and I already knew that I was not, that was not my strength okay. and I wanted something probably more hands-on if I had to learn how to actually record music. So it was actually my mom that heard about this school. She was like, why she didn't was, you... She was a teacher. Oh, she was a teacher then, so... Yes. Yeah, she had a network. So, probably... She probably has to run a bit. Yeah, she asked around a bit, she talked to someone and she was like, this is this private school. This is a private school. I was wondering, actually. Yes, it's a private university. Yeah. And they give you but the equivalent... Uh, Universita. Universita, yes. Okay. So my degree is the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. So that this mean you got two degrees, one in architecture and the other one? I never finished architecture. I, I dropped out. I dropped out. Oh. Well, okay. And so how long... Was that degree in St. Louis College of Music? Uh, four years. In they English? Had, uh, in Italian, uh, but you had like, they, they teach you English as well. So after that, Les Amis di Maturita, you've got nine years of studying? Yes. Okay. Right. So they have a preparatory uh, year, if you don't know anything about audio. So you did it? So I did it. I and then I did the three years for really? the bachelor's degree. Okay. So it's four years total. And uh, Which um, district of uh, Rome is it based in? It's in a uh, city centre. It's in uh, Rione Monti. Very close to the uh, Altare della Patria. Like That's cool. Via Cavour. Oh, lovely. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, nice, nice city nice centre. Nice shops there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice to commute. To this part of town every every day, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to take the train and then change and get the metro, metro A, or metro B, metro B. Yeah, and this is definitely not something you can do like distance learning. You have no. to be there, right? Yes, Hands yes. And, and they had a studio there. Were they uh, good? Do you think it's a good good university? I do think it's a good uni. Uh, at the time, they didn't have many facilities. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that I found here when I came to the institute because I, I wanted to be more hands-on and have more uh, spaces be, being able to learn and and also like maybe a big, big desk or um, that you, kind of you thing. the Abbey Road Institute. Yes, sorry, right. the Abbey Road Institute. So um, I studied uh, St. Louis those four years and I felt like I got a lot of theory uh, okay. out of it. And not what do you mean theory? Because I mean, I'm trying to think. I mean, here you probably don't really need to have to, to read score sheets, or maybe a bit less than when you are playing an instrument. But what sort of theory would you would you dig into? I was thinking about more audio, like um, uh, the physics of audio. How to get a great sound? Yeah, I mean, we studied everything related to sound, which means also how am I going to build a studio okay. with a good acoustic? Mm. So we, I studied acoustics as well, and then I studied how system works, like PA. If you do live sound, how are you going to get those speakers to be in sync with these other speakers? Of course. Or um, I, I had a module that was about um, everything that is electric, so you don't get uh, you know, electrocuted on the job because you handle oh. a lot of power when you work in some of venues. Course, so it was very, very technical. And in the meantime, I was doing music theory, piano. Wow. Uh, and well, practicing piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to do it. And then I was uh, studying uh, music for film. Oh, uh, so and I had the practice. What you mean, like uh, creating, being, being? Uh, what do you mean? Music? History okay. of music for film. History of music for film. Yeah, and then I had the time in the studio, so I had to learn every microphone, how they worked, how a desk, a music desk works, a mixer, um, and then there's also all the protocols for softwares, what MIDI is, all the different DAWs, so digital audio workstations, so all the softwares that we use to record audio, manipulate audio. What is MIDI? MIDI is a protocol to be able to send sort of um, data okay. from an instrument to a computer or vice versa. So when you play a keyboard that doesn't doesn't have any sound in it, mm -hmm. you probably gonna have a MIDI cable going to your laptop, and that's where the sound is. So the the keyboard is sending a MIDI signal to your computer uh, that tells the computer which. Um, 
note you are playing on the keyboard. And you're basically controlling, remotely controlling whatever software you have on your computer. What about editing once you, you have a recording where you learn yeah. this as well? Yeah, I was learning that. I was learning uh, about editing. I was learning about mixing. I was learning about mastering. Everything. I mean, it's three years long plus one, so it's four years long. So we got into basically every aspect of audio possible. Was that a good recipe to get your depression away? Oh yeah, work? oh yeah, it was amazing. The recordings of my Thank band you, improved mommy. a lot. Thank you, mamma. <laughs> grazie mamma, grazie papà. <laughs> Infinitamente grata. Um, because in the so meantime, yeah, I was applying that to my band mm -hmm. stuff, so. Yes. I was recording our music and I started doing a bit of freelancing. I was doing live sound in a, in a venue mm -hmm. and then I got to work for a uh, um, music company that was doing a music for TV. So we did it, I, did, I worked on this show that it was like um, a kids talent show for Italian TV. So we were doing music for that. So it, while I was studying, I was keeping music. Was that in Cinecittà? Because I remember that the, the, the famous film studios are, are based close to Rome or in Rome. Cinecittà. Yes, Cinecittà is yeah. uh, like huge for cinema. Okay. Um, it, it's still working, right? It's oh yeah, still, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. still, still there. But what I was, uh, what I was. Did working, you have a chance to work there sometimes? No, no. because for TV with all the. Uh, Mediaset stuff, which is channel four, five, and six. Well, um, in Italy, in Italy, in Italy they have um, Mediaset. That's uh, Berlusconi, no? It was, yeah, it was Berlusconi <laughs> stuff. So they have their big studios. that are uh, just outside of Rome, I think, on Via Salaria, if mm -hmm. I'm correct. Yeah. And so you were going there. So I, I went there for a few times, and it was actually really uh, in, interesting to me to see how they do editing for TV, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty different from editing for uh, music. Um, th th when you edit music, you, c you try and be musical about it. When you edit for TV, you're trying to be practical about it. Sure. So it's two completely different approaches, two di completely different um, uh, softwares as, as well that they were using. So I got to see another side of the music business. Which is probably very useful for you now because I understand that in your, in your work that you do nowadays for Abbey Road Studios, sometimes you have to work on projects which include movie scores and, and, and therefore need to fit to the uh, yes to, um, to the video and uh, yeah shots the, and stuff. The idea of having the picture in sync with the music yeah. and then having the music um, maybe fading out or fading in when there's a dialogue and the idea of uh, uh, about the music being sometimes complementary or in the background and some other times being very prominent. That's That's been uh, interesting also yeah, to see how it works in TV. Yeah, yeah. So how do you, well thanks, that's, that's very enlightening. Um, and so how, what are the links between the Abbey Road um, Institute, Institute and, and the, the uh, St. Louis College of Music? Are they close or was it just like a coincidence? From what remember? I know, there's none. Um, so how did you come across the Abbey Road Institute in another country? <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I got to my degree and I was freelancing and then studying and having my band and my projects, um, I was at the moment in my life where I looked in the mirror, mirror I was like, if I want to do this job, because my aim was to try and get into a studio. Mm -hmm. But I was looking around me in Rome. I gather there aren't many studios in Rome. <laughs> no. Okay. no. Oh, you need to be a, a man in your 50s or 60s and super connected. You said that. Uh, this is exactly how it is. Um, there are not many studios. The ones that are there are mostly uh, the same people that have been there for like 30 years. Um, and it's pretty difficult to find a place like, to put a, f a, f a foot in the door. Yeah. Um, so I was doing a lot of things. Uh, I, I thought I was working really hard, but I couldn't see how I could achieve my dream, let's say, l staying there. So at some point I thought, is either I leave and I try and do what I want to do somewhere else, or I stay here and I just, you know, accept the fact that it's going to be difficult and probably I'm never going to get there. Um, After all this work and this studying, that, that would have been yeah. a shame. So 
my parents were really nice about it again and I told mom and dad I want to leave so I got my degree I graduated with honors at St. Louis College of Music so I showed that I was committed um well leave leave for where did you have an idea did you want did you look at the states as well um no because I know it's pretty difficult with visas to Uh to kind of and it was really far away as well at the time my brother was living here in London Okay. Mm-hmm. So I could come and just take a look around. I had already visited a few times and I thought London was a really nice city. You could wear your Doc Martens, no problem here. Yes. For sure. And then I made the research about where the music industry is actually bigger in Europe. Because I thought if I have to leave and I don't want to go to a different continent. Well, either here or Sweden, but I don't know, probably I would um, here. <laughs> I've never been to Sweden. Well, you know, with all the ABBA, you know, the Swiss, oh, yeah, right? yeah, 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 true, true. Um, so what, 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 what came out of your research? What was that, the best? that the biggest, uh, in terms of revenue and uh-huh. how big the, the, the business is, uh-huh. uh, England and London specifically were like the, the top okay. um, city to go. And then there was Germany with Berlin, and there was uh, Amsterdam, uh, so basically the north of Europe. Mm. And since I heard well, they were a bit below, though. Yes. Yeah. So since I knew already a bit about London, I made a research about schools in London where I could get more practical experience, and I could maybe study. Um, my aim was not more than a year because I also needed to get my English uh, going. Uh, like I had a, a good English, but not enough, not nearly enough to be able to work in an environment where everyone was native. Um, so I thought if I do six months uh, or a year somewhere in a school, full-time, part-time, I don't know, let's see what the program is, and I can get access to a studio or more than one because they have the facilities, I'm going to be able also to pick up on English and learn new things and learn how the business works there, rather than just move to London and try from scratch, knowing nobody, to try and find a job there. You want it to be a network as well. Yes. Yeah. So in my research, I found different schools, and I thought, uh, and I and I saw that the Abbey Road Institute was, um, well, it had the name, of course. So I was like, let me take a look at the program. The program starts almost from scratch, from the bra- basics of sound and what basic of uh, music theory, until the end of it, which is like very in depth in all of the audio related uh, topics and music production. To a degree, these, these are things which you you had already studied in in Rome, wasn't? Yes, yeah. um, some stuff. But, but yes, in, in Italian. But in Italian. <laughs> so I thought if I start from something easy and I pick up the language, and exactly. then the program goes, and it gets more intense and more complicated, Very I'll be smart. able to, to understand more. Very smart. So, so I enrolled. I came for the interview. Um, so when was that exactly? Which year? 2000? 2018. 18. Wow. 2018, it was, I think, they started recu- recruiting in September. September of 2017 and I think I came for the interview in January 2018 and the course started uh, in February 2018 so they sent me the letter you know you've been accepted Uh, you have to demonstrate a certain uh, knowledge of music theory uh, or um, like present projects you worked on Um, you need to be able to play an instrument it doesn't Piano and guitar, so you're good. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily. You don't have to be a virtuoso of the instrument, but you know the the necessary to kind of be able to understand what ha- harmony is, for example. Um, so I did that. I got my letter. I got accepted, and a month later I was here in London and I started studying at the institute. So the institute at the time in 2018 was here. It was not yes. in Angel yet. Yes, okay. not not just yet. Okay, so they had. Uh, Three production rooms, they were um, smaller than the, what they have now, and they had uh, the Custom 75, which is a studio that is actually here uh, in Abbey Road Studios, mm-hmm. um, where they have a, an Eve desk. So um, that's not, sorry. Is a, um, an Eve is a brand that makes um, 
mainly desks and mixers, uh, but also all the parts for it. So preamps, so when you, you see like this sort of uh, platform with all the, the buttons and stuff. Yeah, and all the, like uh, a spaceship control. Exactly. Uh, and yes. you call it a Neve. That's a, that's one brand, but there are many others like SSL. Neve desk. Yeah, they had they had and they have a Neve a Neve desk um, for that particular studio at the okay. institute, and I never had in my life the chance to work on a Neve, wow. so I was really happy about it. Um, so you, how it worked? Like, what would be a ballpark figure for these kind of uh, of big stations? How what, how much would that this, this sort of thing cost? For example, a Neve desk. Uh, oh, it depends. Yeah. Uh, it depends if it's new, if it's used, if it's a vintage range. model. Mm -hmm. From tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. Wow, okay, it's a big investment. To it's a huge investment, some yes. Studio. Okay. So, yeah, I got access to the studio and I never left the studio since <laughs> then. I four years, yeah? Plus, uh, yeah, four yes. years, plus the one year at the, yeah. the academy. Wow. wow, and I can see on your. Uh, yes? Uh, I can see on your. Um, profile on uh, the Abbey Road website that your work is quite diverse. I mean, you, you, you're not doing just one thing. Um, whilst at the studio, she has worked on many projects, including movie scores for Marvel, Disney and Netflix, such as Black Widow, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Doctor Strange, um, Fantastic Beasts, Matrix, Resurrection, Shang-Chi, I haven't heard of Shang-Chi, but so that's pretty cool. And also that you worked with Joe Bonamassa, so probably on the, on the more, where you say, um, something that would come to mind more if you think of the work of, of a sound engineer. So you worked with Joe Bonamassa, now Rogers, that's cool, Kaiser Chiefs, Bastille, among others, and Alexandre Desplat, who is uh, one of the favorite um, composers for Wes Anderson, yeah. and uh, probably others as well. So, how, how, what did you actually request to be put on film projects, or so? Um, an interesting thing about Abbey Road is that you never know who's gonna come to record here. I'm sure um, you have a book, you know, of autographs. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be professional about it. Well, but you can be professional <laughs> to get an autograph. And true, a true. Or a picture, maybe. Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, and um, so basically what happens is that the clients uh, book the studios because they need it for the projects. And um, there's a... Uh, we our team is around 25 people if I'm correct so we get allocated to the sessions so when needed like the technical stuff so 25 people or yeah. you, that includes also the, the admin and um, and no, accounts just the sound engineers so 25 sound of wow. different levels yeah. comprehending the runners as well right that's big work. yeah do you know actually I'm sure you know that but I personally live just in front of Rack Studio. I personally live just in front of Rack Studios, nice. which is uh, which is in, I think Chelton Avenue or something. And I've heard recently also that the BBC Studios just got bought by a conglomerate and I may call a group. And uh, um, uh, Hans Zimmer. Hans, and one of them is Hans Zimmer, the famous yeah. composer. So I was like, gosh, it's amazing how. Central's good. Central's wood in this part of London has got so many, and Maidenville as well, because yeah. they're called the Maidenville Studios. Has got so many sound engineering studios around here, and I'm just in the middle of it. And so, but probably I think Abbey Road Studios, with its 25 sound engineers, uh, would probably be the biggest. I should think. I'm not. Think? I'm not aware of the amount of stuff they have. But uh, yeah, I would say. Rack Studios for sure. You're bigger than Rack Studios. Yeah. But, but Abbey Road, do you think. Uh, sorry, I meant um, Main Nouvelle Studios. Do you think they are, might be bigger? Because it's the Beams. I don't, I, I'm, I don't think they have 25 yeah. members of the engineering team. So you're probably team. the biggest. <laughs> probably we are, yeah. yes. Um, yes, so about the diverse pool of mm. clients we have. So yes. we get allocated to different sessions. Uh, of course, uh, each one of us can express a preference. Uh, sometimes it's subject to availability. Sometimes uh, people are on holidays, so you have to cover their shifts, uh, as any other job. Sure. Um, so 
do so, are some projects perhaps more technical than others, and therefore only very senior sound engineers can do them? Or usually, as long as you've gone beyond the stage of being a runner, you are able to do everything as a sound engineer? Um, I would say that some runners as well are able to do everything. <laughs> um, okay, but that's another point. <laughs> Of course, there is different levels. Um, okay. um, we have a different, um, would say, a, a pyramid in some sort of way. So we have the runners, and then uh, you become an assistant engineer, and then after that you become a recordist, which is another very specific figure. You stayed and then an engineer. You stayed as a as a runner for seven months. You said I I was a regular runner for a year, and oh, then yeah. I was senior runner, which means I was managing the runners team. Oh wow! At the moment we have six runners on site, so you need someone that manages them. And I did that for another seven months, and then I became assistant engineer, and that's where I am now. Okay. Yeah. And then you were saying uh, above assistant engineer, I suppose you have engineer. Above assistant engineer, you have recordist. Okay. And then engineer. Right. So your you, your goal at the moment is to become a recordist. Yes, that should be the next step. Okay. Um, but uh, regarding being an assistant engineer for a mo how many months or years? Uh, uh, it's t two years now. Okay. Yeah. And um, to reply to your question, uh, yes, um, different roles have different um, jobs, let's say. Um, so while I, as an, as an assistant engineer, I take care of some parts of the session, of the work, mm -hmm. the recordist takes care of other parts and the engineer of other parts. As you work in duos or trios sometimes. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, to run Studio One, which is the biggest studio we have, yeah. uh, you can have like a hundred piece orchestra in there. Oh, so, so Depla records his uh, his his, uh, his calls with with orchestras in, for example, in Studio, Studio One. One. Yes. So to run Studio One, there's the need for three or four of us. So you're gonna have an engineer, a recordist, and an assistant assigned to the session. Sometimes a runner too. Where is this Studio One? Is it like in the basement or in the main building or? Yeah, yeah, in the main stuff? building. Oh. Like the 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 building from outside looks small, but. Uh, once you yeah. get inside, it's just it's huge. Ah, yeah. But it's got an underground bunker or something. <laughs> no, no it's like um, uh, I hope you got planning permission. <laughs> 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 no, it's actually, once you go in, you go downstairs and you have Studio One live room, which is really big. Um, and uh, Studio Two is just in front of it, and Studio Three is just above. Okay. Um, and those are the three bigger rooms. Okay, and so the small studios are perhaps a bit up on like second, third floor, third story. So you know? the gatehouse is actually just outside. We have a ramp on the left, so uh -huh. it's just like separate. Okay. And the front room is actually the looking at the building, the window on the left. So it's just at the front, in front mm -hmm. of. Reception. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the smaller and we have the other smaller room. One is uh, upstairs at the last floor, like on top of the building. Okay. And then the mix stage is big. It's like cinema big, and is on one side of the building, just outside of it. Like. Okay. So that's cool because you don't have to externalize anything. You can do the whole s supply chain. Yes. Like sort of forward, you know, chain of uh, doing all the tasks up to the final product which is the, the mastering exactly the, yeah. the master completed and uh, yeah we can do everything on site mm. okay and so um yeah so as you were saying uh, sometimes in view of the pla uh, planning of each one and, and stuff you get uh, allocated to a team of two three sometimes even five to do a project and it could be recording a studio session it could be working on a on a film project yes yeah uh, anything else uh, 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 other than these two options um so i would say uh the bigger rooms is of course orchestras for uh, scores so you go anywhere from uh, cinema okay. to streaming services so netflix amazon uh, what, what does this mean in, in practice does this mean that um you are inviting some session musicians that they're going to watch the the, the film being played while they play so that it is a <laughs> it goes with a, what so, 
So if you look at the um, uh, videos of how they recorded some of the Star Wars music uh, in Studio One, for example, with uh, John can, Williams. Can, can I see that? Is it online? Uh, it's online, yeah. You can on, on, your your website? on YouTube. On okay. YouTube. You just type John Williams, Abbey Road Studios, Star Wars, and that's the video there. I'll do that. So once you see that, there's the whole orchestra and there was a big screen with a projector and they would project the movie well, in the go. room. So I was right. Yeah. And the conductor would give, you know, the cues to the orchestra to go in time with and they had the click as well. So each okay. musician has a click track. a click track. So you know it's funny because this is how it used to be done in the silent film era, where they they basically had all these musicians playing with the the, the, the film being shown on screen and exactly. everybody laughing. Because at the time I mean, of the music I don't think yeah. they had the click track, so well, the musician was playing yeah. and they was looking at where yeah. it should land for, I don't know, an explosion or uh, ah, someone... So while well, here it's actually with the click track that they have the, the cues? Exactly. So um, at the beginning click track was not a thing, but it was the conductor that was yeah. watching the movie, the yeah. orchestra was watching exactly. the movie, and they were trying to go in time with that. John Williams has um, a way of doing it with a clock, for example. So it was looking at the seconds on the clock, okay. and it was timing that to the movie because of the number of frames mm -hmm. and, and everything was coinciding with kind of 60 seconds in a minute. But that was a complicated way, like his way of doing it. Yes. What we do right now is that the movie and the picture that is not streamed anywhere, like the, con the orchestra cannot see it. We have a click track that goes with the movie mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes the conductor has the picture sometimes they don't so they basically the orchestra basically relies heavily on the click track that and goes score. in sync and score and of score. course all right okay so they all wear some headphones they all wear headphones yes yeah. I, I actually was a, a flautist in an ensemble would be an ensemble in bloomsbury would be an ensemble mm -hmm. and once we for a special project we, we recorded a piece i think it was in uh, in a church um, so very good acoustic, and I loved it. I'm not a very good, I mean, like I'm an amateur flautist, but I really loved it. This whole process of um, being part of our song mm -hmm. and being recorded, um, and with the with the a conductor who who shows you where to do what, etc. Yeah. Et it was really cool. It's not making a noise and really. <laughs> Um, yeah, you cannot make yes. an, not any noises, you're going to ruin the take. Yeah. yeah, But it must be very stressful though, if you have to follow the uh, the video on screen. I mean, you must be really, as a, as a musician, you must be a, a session musician, you must be really Amazing. an ace. Also, there's, they and don't... Well prepared. So, m most of the projects are, obviously, everything is unreleased. So they work on music that is original and, uh -huh. uh, you know, trying to keep it as secret as possible. Sometimes the musicians don't even know what the movie is. Really? Yes, we use code names on the, on the score. So they don't know what they are actually recording. They just record the music. Properly session musicians. Yes. So what they do, they don't get the score beforehand. They just come in, they sit, they open it. Sight and they reading. They sight read everything. Have you not noticed that how the Brits are good at sight reading? It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. This is really something I noticed when I was part of this Bloom, when, would, uh, Bloom, Bloomsbury would win would some. They sound... On, it was shit, like the floatiest. <laughs> <laughs> British floatiest were the shit is that. Uh, well, us, we proud ourselves, like the more continental European uh, floaties that we try to have like a, a nice sound. But side reading, amazing! I couldn't do it. I had to always practice and really rehearse before yeah. before the, 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 the session to be able to, to follow and to be able to, to play. The British um, musicians were amazing. Well. And this is a really good part. I wonder of how they do it. They must uh, be trained from the outside. No idea. Not my thing. Yeah. I mean, as I told you, reading music is a, something that I can do, but, but not but fast I, enough. I did a lot of solfege, a lot of... Uh, when I was in this conservatoire in France but I don't think that we were actually really trained in sight reading because it, it I don't think that anybody told us that sometimes you are put in a position where you actually don't have the time to rehearse beforehand yeah. and you need to 
play what you see on the sheet now. That's something about cl the classical world that I don't really understand in terms of... Um, I, I know people that were the, uh, studied at the conserva conservatory in Rome, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not something they teach. Well, there you go. There because you go. they are thinking about, about classical music, which is something you rehearse so many times. Indeed. You need to interpret, and then your maestro is going to tell you how to, uh, you know... Um, um, manage the, the the BPM of what you're playing, if mm. you're going to be faster or slower in terms of your interpretation or whoever. So to to be able to um, play a concerto, I, I agree, you need Martha. months and months and months of studying. But, but here, they do it even if they are classically trained. Yes. Yeah. But I, really. I also... Exactly. But, but here there's a business for this kind of recordings. Uh -huh. There's so many studios, and people know there is an option to become a session musician in an orchestra to record um, uh, soundtracks for movies. And then you have to know how to sight read super fast. So, uh, right, 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 right. so that's probably why they, they learn it as because it's part of a trade. Wow, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I was just flabbergasted every time it happened. It's amazing, and a really good part of why the uh, clients, or in this case also uh, um, the um, uh, people like the Spla. Come, the Pla, the Pla, the Pla, the Pla, sorry, the Pla. Uh, my French is not uh, <laughs> on point. Uh, Alexandre de Pla. I'm sure the British also say Alexandre de Pla. Everyone here says yeah. the Pla. The plan. Now I know. Um, a good part of why these uh, big names come here to record is yeah, because all... he's based in Los Angeles, isn't he? Yes. It? Like Zimmer. Yes. So many people are based somewhere else, but then they come here to record because they know that we have. They, they get the time. best facility, the best technical team, and the, the, the best acoustics, but also the amazing musicians that Session they can find in London. Uh -huh. And who are okay to work like under a code name and not, e not even knowing yeah. what the project is, which I, I really don't think would work out very well in no like ego. continental European <laughs> context. No yeah. even involved, just the craft. Wow. Okay, so, um, and usually those sessions, especially for films, I mean, they must be going on for all day, I suppose. Um, yes, uh, they're usually, uh, actually, um, these kind of sessions have really strict timings because the orchestra gets booked for a set amount of hours. Oh, it's like, a, like an actor. Like yes, yeah, like yes, that. and since there is a musicians' union that regulates the breaks and how much music can be recorded in one day, oh, really? um, we usually do sessions of three hours with a break in the middle, and then you have an hour break and another session of, of three what? hours. Oh, I mean, that's pretty. That's seven hours in total, isn't yes. it? Yes, a day's work. Yeah, and usually does it go for like? two, three, four days in a week or um, in, a, in a row or because I mean a film is is two or three hours I mean especially those massive blockbusters you've worked on like uh, Black Panther and The Matrix these are two hours and a half movies yes so well, typically two hours and a half long movies sorry. typically for a movie you would have uh, anywhere between 40 minutes and an hour is a lot of music like to record Okay. In terms of minutes. Really? Yes. All right. 40 minutes to an hour for like a two hours to three hours long movie. Yes. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Because yeah, you, you don't need a week to, for that. Uh, depends. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Depends. Okay. Um, sometimes you have, I don't know, maybe three, four days booked. And then there's a, a period of time where that project doesn't come back. They, because they're finishing the picture, the director is making changes, so we recorded the music for, let's say, 15-20 uh, minutes, and then they come back 3-4 months later uh -huh. to do the rest of it. What, is it like uh, post-production, after the production, or...? Yes, yeah, sometimes it goes um, together. Side by side. Somet most of the time, music is the last thing that gets recorded. <laughs> Where everyone is out of budget, out of time. Right. So also, you must be under massive pressure. To well, it is very important that we don't lose even a minute. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine you have an orchestra of, let's say, ninety-six piece orchestra in Studio One, and then you lose ten minutes because a microphone doesn't work, you can imagine the how. Same. Apart from the shame, but you can imagine how much money the client is losing because every minute of the orchestra is a, almost a hundred musicians that are not playing. 
Mm-hmm. So that's money you're losing. Yeah. So that's why everything needs to be always perfect and we check. Okay, so sound engineers, you need to be super prepared. Like this Yes, guy, yes. We prepare everything prepare, beforehand. Prepare, prepare. Everything. We check everything so many times. Mm-hmm. We start setting up the day before for the morning after until it's done and checked. And the morning we come back and we check again before the session. So aside from Dipla... Did you have the likes of Hans Zimmer coming in as well? Or does he usually go to the um, Made of Air studios that you just bought? He came over for... for he? Yeah, he's been for years. I didn't okay. have the pleasure of uh, being on one of his sessions. Okay. But, but yeah, he's been, he's been coming over quite a lot. Should I know Stephen Price and, um, and Thomas Newman? Are they also compo- uh, composers yes. of films? Yes. Okay. So, if I'm, uh, so, for example, 1917, um, the oh, yeah. Film, yeah, yeah. That's was that was Newman. Mm. Uh, British? Mm, American? Not sure. Okay. Maybe American? Uh, I, I do. I, I'll, I'll I'm not it. sure. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Price as well comes over uh, quite a lot. Uh, so these are all guys based in Los Angeles, though, British or not British? Not, okay. not all of them. No. Yeah, uh, but these people that come over quite a lot. Um, Thomas Newman for 1917, actually, he was um, he took, he was here for three months, mm-hmm. and he used uh, the front room studio to compose the music oh, wow. as they were giving him the film. And in those three months, uh, then we got to the stage of uh, recording the whole soundtrack in uh, in Studio One with the whole with the whole orchestra. orchestra yes, music. so so he spent a lot of time with us. He yeah, a, a, a lot of meals together. So probably <laughs> probably if you needed your front room studio, it means that it, it doesn't live in London. It's probably based somewhere else. Probably. Mm. Right, and so. In terms of working with um, really famous um, pop and um, and um, rock musicians like Bonamassa, uh, Bonamassa, apologies, and uh, and Nile Rodgers, how, how how is this more like a, a cool ambience? Is it more relaxed or is it pretty full on as well? Working so I will. I was lucky enough to get uh, quite a lot of um, guitar players uh, by coincidence. So Joe Bonamassa, Nan Rogers, and uh, also Eric Clapton came oh, wow. over. Yeah. And uh, um, it really depends from the person. Uh, people like Nile Rogers are. Uh, pretty uh, used to be um, working uh, at a fast pace Mm -hmm. Um, so it's always like a whirlwind of ideas you know get the guitar and just record this and what if we put some drums in there and then this and this and this is that his working process? yeah it's it's pretty fast do you know that this guy actually was born to a single mom who was actually a drug drug addict I know I I read his book oh you did yes (laughs) well done I didn't but I mean this guy must be a genius to come yeah. to, to achieve what he's achieved, uh, coming from where he was coming. I mean, he's a uh, really so he's, he's extreme. His mind is like, yeah, 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 yeah. A lot, lot of energy, a lot of energy, mm. a lot of ideas. He's just exceptional. Yes. Uh, and then I got to spend uh, a week in Studio One with Joe Bonamassa, uh, and they were recording like a whole album called Royalty. That was the whole concept was based, you know, based in the UK. So. I think this guy has got like 300 guitars or something, he collects them. Oh yes, them probably and he more. brought quite a few here it for is. the recording. Yes. What, out of Denmark Street? No, 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 he, he brought his own guitars. Oh, he brought with, them over? Yeah, 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 okay. with with like these these huge boxes that they came and they, they put in Studio One. And wow. He opened the boxes and there's... Yeah, and, and he's a collector. He was saying, I listened to a podcast of, uh, uh, about him and he was saying... If I date a girl, a woman, and she asks me, why do you spend so much money buying guitars? I just finish the dating process. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's yeah, you cannot even question <laughs> why. <laughs> um, but yeah, that so was... Uh, if he's, it's, uh, yes. Was that only for his whole sole, sole use, or was it for all, all the other session musicians as well? That he was no. going to lend them these guitars to them? No, no, the other musicians had their own guitars. 
Um, and uh, they took over Studio One. So what, what does that mean? So it, that was just his guitars for him? Yes, yes, yes. So he brought like a massive case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How many guitars were there? Mm. Just three? I don't know. 20, 30, I don't know. This is so many, so many. And did he use them all? Um, maybe not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And a lot of amplifiers as well. Okay. And uh, he brought in his um, technical team. So there was a person that was taking care of all the guitars and the string, new, putting new strings and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the... Is that what you call in the live circuit of Rody? Uh, a roadie. Yeah, do you call do you call you say more te technical? Yes. Yeah, you wouldn't say yes. roadie in this context of. Studio. Um, well, it 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 actually is that person because it's, it's the, the same, same person, right? Yeah, that follows him okay. live. So yeah, exactly. But you yes. probably don't call him a roadie in the case of a of a, of say, yeah. Okay. Um, what, what would you call this kind of person? Looks after all the, the music equipment and does all the logistics and stuff. Uh, technical. Technical team, G guy. G G guitar um, tech, oh, that's what we would guitar say, tech. guitar tech. Okay. And we also had a, a drum tech, because we had a... So, so basically, Joe Boramassa, what he does, he, he uh, gets um, this band together, which uh -huh. is made of all um, kind of freelancers in, in the musicians' world. Okay. Um, so he got the band together, and uh, the, the drummer actually had his own um, drum tech. Okay. So he brought his own drum kits and, you know, you know every, took care of all of the part of the, the drums. Um, I must take a lot of space. Which oh, yeah. studio did you use? For uh, this? Interestingly, we used Studio One, which is the biggest studio and is not uh, probably the best acoustic the space uh, for a band mm -hmm. because I uh, thought so because of space right 20 guitars just for one guy then all the um, all the musicians have to come with their own guitars plus the drum kit plus all these techs I mean yeah it means they need but a lot of space. usually bands tend to go to studio two which is the most famous studio because of the uh, Beatles so oh. they recorded um, 80 plus percent of their discography in Abbey Road Studios and majority of it is Studio 2. Did you know that Steve, Mc uh, Paul McCartney, sorry, has got his house just over there in, Ca in Acacia yes. Road? Just, yes. Yeah, please I've, understand. I've walked around yeah. there a couple of times just, you know, looking at the gate. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, I, I actually met Paul McCartney a couple of times here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he came over uh, for different reasons. There was a period of time where Mary McCartney was making this uh, beautiful documentary about Abbey Road Studios and then came out uh, on Disney+. Plus. Of course, yes. I, I heard a review of that on Kermode and Mayo's Take, which yes. is a great podcast about films. And uh, I think that they said that basically it was a bit all over the place. So it <laughs> Do you, do you recommend it? Um, I was actually... Did you, did you like it as a I, documentary? I liked it a lot. You did? And okay. I, I was really... I, I got really emotional watching it. Really? Yes, okay. because you see something on screen and you're like, I actually work there. I'm part of the history of the mm. place. Even if it's a small part, because it, Abbey Road has been here for 93 years now, and I'm, I've been here just four years. Yeah. But, you know, it makes you proud. 93 years, wow. Yeah. Um, so so you met him as part of his project in particular? Um, uh, he was going in and out to be interviewed as well uh, because of the um, documentary and then one day well, he came over... It's like a five minutes walk from his house. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he's there all the time but you know. And then once he came over, I was in Studio 3 with some clients and he wanted to take a look around the new studio because uh, Studio two, uh, 3 was refurbished at the beginning of the year. So um, I, uh, one of my colleagues came over and was like, um, would you mind, uh, Paul McCartney wants to take a look around the studio, do you think you have clients? I don't mind so! <laughs> so I did, obviously didn't mind, but my clients didn't expect that at all. So okay. when I went to the client, I was like, I'm sorry, there's someone that wants to see the studio, are you okay with it? By the way, it's Paul McCartney, is that alright with you? And my client was like, oh my god, y yes, of course, you know, completely unexpected. And uh, and uh, yeah yes yeah, so, so sometimes he he comes over and uh, but uh, that's the magic of the place as well. Um, what was your favorite project all in all in the last four years? 
Huh. I've had so many good the days. The most creative one. Most yeah. creative? Well, yeah, the most creative one where you were just like in awe at the process and, and the beauty of what was coming out of it. But to be fair, the Factory of um, the so. Jobo Namasa one was a really interesting one because you don't get the bands to um, get the studio for that many days and be there and, and be creative in the studio. You usually get the people that already have the music ready and yeah. they want to be as quick as possible at recording because, because of the budget. budget and they need to you know get this thing done mm. and they've been um, composing and doing things somewhere else. The, the creative process happens somewhere else. Oh, but right. in, in that week, since... Um, yeah, but you did say that, for example, with Nile Rogers, he makes a lot of suggestions to make the sound more attractive yes. and to enhance. But uh, uh, Nile Rogers works on a lot of projects at the same time. So maybe one day he comes from, for one thing and the other day he comes from a different project. Wow. But the Job on Amasa one was the first time in my life I, had, I got to witness a whole... Um, album made uh, from top to from the first to the last song in one week with all the musicians in the same place and the way he goes about his solos for example or his guitar parts he has some ideas and he plays that and then he he, he, he tweaks them um, talking to his producer or his engineer and the people around mm -hmm. and I have never seen him with a piece of paper with the solo written on it because he just goes about it so Mm -hmm. It's really nice to witness the fact for for once is not a score. Mm -hmm. It's just everything is already decided so you say almost. He improvises. Yes, he has a lot of Constantly. there's a lot of pro pro improvisation and it is actually really nice to have the band play all together all the time for like a whole week and saying oh this thing doesn't really work yeah I have an idea of the lyrics this is gonna talk about this okay so but what if we add these bars here Very what if we change yes and that was the first time that I for a whole week I got to see all of that happening so, and then it was done but how many takes it was, so it was an album with what 12 songs or yeah it was a full album so I think it was more than 10 songs right and every time how many takes is that per song if if at that point, you don't count the takes because you're just, you know, once you've done uh, the main band stuff and you tweaked for hours and you're happy about the harmony and about the timing and about the rhythm and everything, and then you go on top with the rest of it, for example. Oh, so you're saying that you take one take, but then there's something, wait, it was a bit screwed up. Are you going to use another, uh, an extract from another take to actually just splice it in wherever was the screw up? You can do that, you yes. Uh, with editing, you can do whatever you like. Okay, wow. But the way we would do it is we would have bass, uh, drums, uh, the um, um, ryth rhythmic guitar. and So the basics of the band, they were all playing together and he would sing a scratch vocal. So he would sing with the band as if they were playing live, but we would not use that vocal particularly. He would redo the vocals uh, later with a nicer microphone in an environment that was a bit um, without other noise, you know, other instruments around. So you would take it out of a take? Yes. Of, which was with you. Yes. And then we would add many guitars, a lot of layers of guitars, and then the solos, and then... Is that what you do afterwards? And sort of post-production, you, you do that here? Uh, we, we did it, you, you in, did. in that case, we did it with him in the studio with the time we oh, had. At, at the same like, time? At the same During time. That week. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. It's just like a proper craft and a lot of... Uh, yes. A lot of attention to detail. Yes. And, and the different projects... Creating a beautiful jewel, jewelry piece or something. Unique. Yeah. Always. So that was for you, that was exceptional. exceptional for that was an, ex an exceptional week. Yes, definitely. So where do you see yourself in the, in the next five years? I mean, what, 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 do you think of going back to far right Italy? <laughs> um... So, um, if everything goes well, I'll keep doing what I'm doing, I'll keep progressing, I'll mm. keep learning. Okay. So um, is that how you feel at the moment? You're relearning day by day? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Every day is a school day, yeah. um, especially in this place. 
Um, I've worked on a lot of different projects and I'm very happy about how my career progressed up okay. until now. Okay. So it's, um, it's pretty fast paced. Yes. Uh, I think I got to a point now where I'm confident enough uh, about my skills and what I learned that I'm kind of breathing a bit more because when you start a new job, you 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 have to learn a lot of things very fast, mm -hmm. and since there's quite a, a lot of pressure on us, uh, you have to do it fast, but you have to do it right as well. So after a few years, I know the rooms, yeah. I know the people, um, I'm I'm more confident in what I'm doing, and I think that's important to get to a point, and you're like, okay, now I can put the extra, like my personality mm -hmm. in it. I'm not worried about anymore. Uh, your personality in the sound engineering? Yes, in, in the way you work, in your workflow, in the way you interact with clients. There are some um, kind of uh, nuances on the job mm -hmm. that you're not uh, maybe focusing on when you're so focused on actually getting it right. So you're saying that there are different styles of sound engineering? Processes? Yes. Yeah, of course. Mm. And it, it's incredible. And both can you actually recognize sometimes, oh, this, has been, this, this is a sound engineering that has been done by so-and-so? Uh, well, it's a bit more difficult with uh, movies because uh, everything is a bit more set in stone in the process. Mm. But yes, of course, even really? the, mostly the mixing process, that's something really personal. Like, it has to sound good, but um, if there's quite a few engineers that if you really know their work you kind of recognize what they've done. So are you saying that at the moment you are finding your style and that you want to keep on developing your own style of sound engineering? Is that where you are in your... In your what I'm saying is that... Development um, stage? I think I developed my style Already? and I think okay. I am ready now after years of learning new things and being very focused on uh, on the technical part, I think I'm at the stage now where I can open my mind to something more creative and getting my way of working across instead of just doing things in the right way. So are you saying you want to bring business in? You would like to bring, bring some new bands here or some new clients? Oh, I, I don't have, like, I'm not the booking... Um, uh, a team for the studios, but of course well, I, I, mean, I can work with clients. If, if some engineers have got different styles, especially in the mixing process, I, I suppose that some of the clients they come here because they like this oh, yeah, personality yeah, yeah. and this sound yes, engineering of style. Course. Yeah. So that's also part of attracting clients. Yes, yes. Doing my best and get people and clients to know me and know my work, that's always the best you can do for them to then come back and ask for you again, which happens. So this means I'm doing something right. <laughs> oh, it's already the case? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. In the years, it happened quite a few and times. And do you have some, uh, some lady colleagues here or around uh, among oh. the 25 the 25 uh, members of a team, you are the sole representative of the feminine sex or do you do, do have some colleagues who are also? I do have some uh, colleagues. Uh, there is um, uh, the senior runner at the moment, she's called Sara. Mm -hmm. Where and is she She's from uh, Brazil, Okay, but she studied in the US. Uh, she's a Berkeley graduate. And uh, I, um, in the runners team, we have, I think, four girls. Okay, so it's like really junior level. Yes. Yeah. But things are changing. Yeah. Before we've got kids and stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, to, to be fair, even if they have kids, I know plenty of sound engineers here in London that are women. They have a family and they oh, have kids. Okay. So okay. It is um, it is about representation, yeah. always. Because if you see someone that you know can manage a family and have a, an amazing career being an, an engineer, yeah. you probably understand that you can do it yourself as well. Yeah. Um, so it happens that... So at Abbey Road we have engineers, but also we get external engineers coming from outside. Okay, freelancers. 
Yes, and uh, most of the time it's the client that maybe is uh, used to work with that uh, particular engineer or the production company that hires external like engineers from around the world. Mm -hmm. So they come here and they record here and we work with them. So it happens quite often that we have women come in. And sound this engineers. is something, a uh, sound engineers, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something I never got to witness when I was in Italy. It's like, as I was growing up, I, so I didn't know anyone. <laughs> And then when I moved here and I got to, to work here and I started seeing them around, it's like, wait, what is happening now? <laughs> so it, you can, it, it can be done. It exists. And um, I wish I had, uh, at the time when I was studying, I wish I had someone um, to I, I could, to. Yes, to look up to, but I didn't have anyone. Well, I mean, you, you made the right move. You came to a place where things could happen. So. Yes, so hopefully they're going to happen everywhere at some point. Yeah, yeah. last but not least, actually, do you have some advice for girls who want to become sound engineers? Um, so something I wish someone would have told me uh, when I was at the beginning it was that it can be done that you can actually do it, that uh, probably is not going to be the easiest path, but it's not the easiest path for everyone, uh, for anyone, uh, guys or, or girls. Um, yes, there are some, um, we might find some more difficulties um, in terms of, uh, again, seeing, um, uh, seeking representation or being able to ask for advice or um, but what I can say about it is that I was really shy so I didn't want to reach out to the people that I wanted to talk to especially women in the industry but now there's a big movement around um, women in uh, um, sound engineering. Did you not go to a, a sort of seminar about that, about ladies yes. working in yes. sound engineering, I think in the US or something, uh, last year, I, uh, or earlier this year? So uh, we did a remote uh, right. thing with Berkeley, with Emily Lazar, who's a, a really important mastering engineer. What is it called, this thing? This movement? Um, um, Do you remember? Uh, a specific name? The, the event had a specific name. Yeah, I think it was um, with girls or, or women in the, in the title. No, it, it was um, We Are Moving the Needle. Okay. Um, so, and uh, there's also different other companies around and organizations that you can reach out to, mm -hmm. and they have a big network of women in the industry, like Sound Girls, for example. Okay. Um, and I think the key is also working together and reaching out to other women in the industry. This is something that I didn't do because I didn't know about it and also I was really shy about it. But when you find someone that you think, oh, is doing something cool, uh, they're working on amazing projects and it seems like a person I could have a chat to or ask for advice to, mm. please reach out because you know we have social media now. Indeed. When I was younger, it was not that big mm. and we were not always connected but so let's use saying, it even if you're not based in London you can still reach out through social yes, media yes yes because uh, maybe you're scared maybe you're a bit shy about things or maybe you you don't know uh, if your knowledge is enough to pursue a career in the industry or you don't know what the next steps are to achieve what you want but someone did it someone in the world managed to do it and there's so many ways uh, you can achieve the same thing and I don't see why I cannot share my experience to kind of help you maybe or open your mind to a different way of, of or a different perspective of saying things okay. so um, if I could give an advice would be actually that reach out uh, and find people with similar stories and see if the paths that someone else opened for you or for the next generations they can be pursued uh, and that can be for you as well. Great. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much for having me. A wonderful, wonderfully enlightening podcast episode. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>